Hello, hello. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. We're all in. We're all good. Perfect. I'll get the ball rolling. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for joining our roundtable discussion on cybersecurity of 2022. In this webinar, we will empower you with the knowledge and tools that'll help shield you and your companies from cyber threats. And I'm going to let Eureka take it away. Well, thank you very much, Catherine, for the introduction to our conversation today, in particular in light of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, very important. And may I add to this, this happens to be also Small Business Month for many. So it's a great combination to have this conversation for small businesses, as well as the cyber community and technologies and tools and solutions that we're here to provide and offer. So. I'm Ulrike Bargadalia. I'm the Senior Director of Digital Economy, Technology and Innovation at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I'll be moderating today's panel and I would like to give a big thank you to Ideological Systems Inc. for having invited me to partake in this conversation. And may I note as well, I, the company is as well a member of the Canadian Chamber's Cyber Right Now campaign focusing on cybersecurity and for Canada to be a global cybersecurity leader. So talk about leadership and how can we become global and more secure and uh, one of the most uh, secure and safest countries in the world. So that's what we are here as well to, to showcase and help you all with. Um, clearly the past two years uh, have shown how the cyber landscape has changed immensely more threats, attacks, breaches, and so forth. And it's it's not a novelty, I hope, to some maybe, but hopefully not to too many organizations listening into today's conversation. But as landscape changes and uh, evolve, we also need to evolve with it. We need to transition, transform. We need to take new initiative and embrace new opportunities and uh, listen and learn and then implement. That's what we're here uh, for today. And we will cover three areas um, during our conversation as soon we'll uh, introduce the three esteemed speakers. We will look at the evolution of cyber activity and then we move on to what should or could organizations do today to be more cyber safe, but also tomorrow. We want to look into the future, not only today. And thirdly, there will be a cybersecurity knowledge share, as we call it. So, over to you, um, gentlemen. Thank you for joining this conversation today. And um, we have here Matt, Wayne, and David. Um, Matt, may I start with you? Could you please introduce yourself and tell us why you're here today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Matt Moline. I am the head of uh, sales and marketing over here at Grid Technologies. Uh, we're a managed service provider that services um, pretty much all of the uh, lower part of Michigan, um, specifically uh, just outside of Detroit and also Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, why I'm here today, I think, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but uh, for us, uh, just con I'm here to help continually educate our, our, our partners um, and as well as our, our clients on the continually growing trends of cybersecurity. Um, as we talk today, um, I think it's gonna be pretty apparent that it is, um, unfortunately it's getting worse before it's gonna get better. Um, but we have a lot of uh, great people here, and I think we have a lot of great solutions that are going to help uh, anyone here individually or if you own a small to mid-sized business. Thank you, Matt. And over to you, David. Same questions to you. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having me. Uh, David Vadassi. I'm a partner development manager with ConnectWise. And we're a company that supports managed service providers um, like Wayne and like um, you know Ideological as well as Matt and 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 the MSP in, in Michigan and really all over the United States and North America, um, really around sharing best practices when it comes to cybersecurity and, and to Matt's point, continually educating small to medium sized businesses, um, you know, on best practices around good cyber hygiene and what that looks like and why it's important so thank you david great for having you here we look forward to hearing your insights and learn from them and wayne last but not least over to you yes thank you so i'm wayne i'm vice president of business development at ideological systems and yeah for the reasons 
everyone said, you know, education is the most important thing to get out of these sessions. And it needs to happen on a regular basis because the threat vectors are coming in different every six months. And we're watching those closely and trying to identify the best practices or tools that may need to put out there to help protect your environment. So be able to get that perspective again from companies in the US because those attacks tend to happen first before Canada, but we don't want to take that for granted. We want to learn from that and try and develop our own best practices here in Canada. Uh, you know, especially working with the uh, the government as well, which is really encouraging to see, you know, the suggestions we could put forward and help protect uh, all businesses, including small to large. So being a part of that is uh, very exciting and uh, very challenging, but uh, we're up to the challenge. So great to be here. Yeah, so thanks everyone. And as we talk about different geographies, different sizes of companies and all sectors. So cybersecurity is really crucial, basically to every business. Every business is a tech business these days. We all engage in digital activities and online. And so how can we protect ourselves and uh, prevent, uh, if at all possible, these kinds of incidents, so-called cyber incidents of all kinds of nature? Wayne, let me then stay with you, if I may. So you talked about the threat landscape and how it has changed. Maybe can you give us um, more details and insights and be a little bit more specific for us to understand? And you mentioned timelines and my um, I've been working in tech over 20 years and the experience often tells me what we have experienced today might be different next month as well. So please go ahead. Thank you. Absolutely. And, you know, we can speak to it from an ideological perspective, what we see out there. And some of the big things, you know, if we were talking a year ago, and these are still active today, but phishing and impersonations are big out there. So we're getting those emails that look like from Netflix or Amazon, they're trying to get you to click on something and enter some information in somewhere. Still very prevalent out there, but that was probably the, the biggest thing a year ago. Uh, where it was kind of actively just trying to hit as many people as they can, but also impersonations where maybe they get your password. You can log in and they're now they're sending emails out as you or trying to spoof, make trying to look, make it look like, you know, they're sending as you with other people, getting them to try and click on a link, stuff like that. So that was the big one, you know, coming into the beginning of this year. Then we saw the zero day attack. So if you don't know what a zero day attack is, is it's essentially a vulnerability in an operating system. For example, Microsoft or Apple where, they don't even know where it exists or they don't have a patch for it yet. So there's that vulnerability that's sitting there and they could that could be exploited without actually some action or some tool to help kind of potentially catch that potential bad behavior before the actual patch is released. So that's a very kind of interesting windows that we're dealing with one after the other after the other. And we're trying to get ahead of that so we can actually protect the environments before the patch that fixes the problem actually gets released. So that's been the big thing this year. And there's been tools that we've been recommending and everyone I'm sure on the panel has been recommending about how to get ahead of that using AI technology and SOC teams to be able to analyze data and see trends in, in actions that are happening in order to get ahead of those particular attacks. And so that's what's really the big button that we're seeing right now that's happening. Uh, what we see kind of coming forward as a, a emerging trend is the, the, the mobile devices. I can't tell you how many texts I've been getting trying to me to click on a link and you know whatever the case may be. And those vulnerabilities on these devices are trying to be exploited. So they're they're, they're testing or they're you know they have some way of getting onto your your phone. So a mobile device management piece to keep that as secure as possible is going to be the upcoming thing. That's that's kind of that's the new vector that's kind of, that we see anyways that's coming, coming in, in definitely in the next year or so. So yeah, that's what we see. Hopefully, I explain that correctly. Where we were. What's this year and what's coming? And uh, along the lines, and that sounds really uh, concerning, let's put it this way. So we need to look at the opportunities, how we protect, but also cybersecurity as an opportunity, right? To learn, to implement, to, uh, to be aware and make others aware. I think we all have accountability. And I always say it starts with me and us in order to um, provide good leadership and lead by example. So... And in that context, to which industry or individuals do you see as um, groups that, that serve as the target, vulnerabilities and so forth, 
um, today and perhaps even also going forward. Um, so anyone maybe on this call uh, probably had also some uh, experiences in the audience as well and say, yeah, exactly when what you talked about that happened already to me. So um, yeah, target audiences, what's happening there? Thank you. Uh, with regards to targets, I can't say we see any particular trends to be, it really just comes down to who is the least protected. The, the, the least amount of barriers that people, that the hacker community can find, those are the ones they're going to exploit. Either they're going to find something that's worth money, or they're at least going to be practicing their skills at, you know, an extreme kind of level. So it's really, you know, the more protection you get ahead of that, you know, you put in front of these people, the less likely they're going to be able to get through. So, you know, because those attack vectors are coming in on different areas where they're just looking for holes where you're probably not protecting your phone or you're probably not protecting your on-premise mail server, that kind of things. Those are where the big vulnerabilities are. So those need to be addressed uh, by moving them to the cloud or putting something else in front of them. So I don't really see industries per se. Uh, maybe Matt or David have a different perspective on that. We are seeing it could be from anywhere. Uh, we haven't had a consistent uh, vertical that we've seen it actually attack through. Yeah, yeah, good point, Wayne. If uh, David or Matt, would you like to comment and chime in here, please? Uh, I'll comment on that. Um, you know, on on our side of things, specific to the U.S., one of the things it does vary uh, time uh, depending on the year and even everything that we went with 2020 and COVID. Um, not to keep talking about COVID, but uh, it, one of the things we saw early 2018, 2019, and even still true today is two specific verticals that um, are seem to be getting the most attention, at least from our experience, is uh, anybody in the construction and also manufacturing uh, side of things. Typically, these two, um, they don't have a lot of reoccurring revenue as, uh, as far as their vertical, vertical is concerned. They're very project-based type of business. Um, so having IT as a as a, as a focus seems to go to the wayside sometimes. I will say though, that has been a lot of interest. Um, even myself personally, I've been invited this, this uh, year to a uh, couple different conferences and speaking about cybersecurity and those gaps and how that there is a specific attack, not only to the small to mid-sized market, but specifically into construction and also manufacturing. Um, what's also helping though in that conversation is and not to get ahead of ourselves, but um, you know, the, in, the insurance world is also um, doing their due diligence and uh, making sure because they recognize the threat also. And uh, they're, we're getting calls from manufacturers and also construction companies saying, my premiums are going to be triple, you know, than what they were unless I start putting these things in place. Um, so that is helping. Uh, but uh, also industry leaders in those verticals, um, uh, whether they're part of, you know, uh, an organization of themselves or part of, you know, other uh, committees and things like that. They, they see it as a threat. Uh, there's been in increases in, um, you know, ransomware attacks and things like that uh, that have happened. So um, it, it's definitely getting attention, but there definitely still needs to be more in those specific areas. Yeah, I would, I would agree as well. Um, both what Wayne and Matt said, you know, is accurate as far as there are, Hackers are really just looking for ways to exploit. They've become more sophisticated using automation. So it may not necessarily be that they're targeting a specific business as much as just looking for a vulnerability on a network. Um, what we do see just across, you know, um, North America kind of, you know, helping a lot of different managed service providers. The industries we consistently see under attack, like uh, Matt said, construction and manufacturing, finance, healthcare, legal, and then obviously just all those SMB businesses that fall below those types of uh, verticals as well that are servicing those industries or or to, you know markets. Um, but yeah, it's it's really a combination of both. It's it's just looking for vulnerabilities as opposed to trying to target just a, a you know a business. Well, you don't, let me continue. Oh, sorry. Was there anyone else who wanted to add a comment? Matt, did you? No, I just said I 100% agree with everything. Uh, okay, well. Said. And I just just one more thing to add is the reason why, the, is one of the reasons why the attack vectors are increasing so much more is this now the, the hacker community is so big, it's now become a hacking as a service, they're calling it, where 
you don't have to be super smart to you know know your coding and stuff to be able to get into places. You can buy packages, pre-built packages that'll make you give you the tools you need to be able to just plug away and look for those vulnerabilities and try and get into where you can. And that's where sometimes people are practicing. So that's how crazy it's gotten. So and hacking as a service, I never thought that term would ever come to be, but here we are. So well, it's a, it's taking off because it's also there's money involved, but it's a multi-billion-dollar business billion not million billion folks and it's um it's all through the dark web you know um it's, it's an environment that's encrypted it's an environment that is pretty secretive very lucrative and um unfortunately there's not um i think it's a resource issue more than anything but um there's a lot um that unfortunately there's, there's not a lot that can be done at the moment um for that but um the responsibility comes down to you as individuals but also you as a, a small business owner to to understand that and protect yourself from that. Well, along those lines, um, David, may I go back to you? How do you protect yourself? And so we talked about there isn't really, well, there are some particular industries you pointed out, but overall, uh, they're looking for vulnerabilities. What tools are in place? Now we need to help protect. So some recommendations on this all sounds uh, very overwhelming and quite frightening, um, but what tools are in place that you could recommend or have seen that work and that you could share with It's your usually business? starting out with a, yeah, yeah. It would usually be starting out by talking with, um, you know, uh, your provider, like an ideological about an assessment, you know, there's, there's security risk assessments that you can use, but then there's also, you know, the actual solutions, things like managed detection and response, having a SOC or a security operations center that is live technical experts that have security certifications. And they're basically your eyes on glass 24 seven watching for those network vulnerabilities and those things, those alerts to come through where they can try and jump in as quickly as possible to remediate any type of an incident that you're having. So it's really that next level of security. Um, you know, and a lot of times these uh, small to medium businesses are, are challenged. They're challenged in terms of having the IT team uh, that may have security skills or expertise needed to be able to do any of the in-house secure, um, you know, so they want the ability to uh, be flexible and be available all the time, but they don't necessarily have the uh, the ability to do it in-house. So it's going to be using things like manage detection and response, um, SOC, SIM, which is an acronym for security incident and event management, a way of seeing just beyond the endpoint um, and being able to see the visibility of your network and gather logs that actually help in forensic David, I think you're breaking up there a little. Um, I, at least, I can't hear you. I'm not sure about the... Perhaps, may, David, may I suggest um, to, until the audio has corrected itself and connection, um, perhaps for the audience here to have Wayne and uh, Matt to, to help out and perhaps as well share their knowledge um what they believe some tools uh uh for the for the target audience could be of use wayne why don't i ask you please sure and so you know security needs to be integrated in layers so each layer some layers could be tools and a lot there are a lot of tools out there so you know the two-factor authentication tool is always a big one other tools that, and what uh, david was mentioning that are scanning the machine constantly not just for malicious activity but you know one activity here, another activity, and those paired together, which may be considered separate, but from an AI point of view, could be, if they're working together, could be malicious. So starting to collect that type of information now is becoming, and that's what helps on the zero day attacks, because there's no protection against this vulnerability. So we want to look for suspicious movements, like trying to look at steps in the mud and we're noticing there's correlations between one or the other. And then they can be presented forward to a team to analyze and see if this is a real threat or not. So essentially putting a spotlight on it, 
oh yes, that's definitely a chain of, of footsteps we see going in the wrong direction. Now we're going to you know take action to keep that from out from our environment. So that's one of the biggest ones out there, especially on the zero day attack is very, very helpful. And David, I think that's what you were talking to when you were kind of cutting out there. Uh, you were you were talking along those lines with regards to yeah. those tools. Yeah, I was. Hopefully, you guys can hear me better. I just switched to a different network. It seems seems to be better. From, seems to be better now. Thank you. Good. Sure. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> technology. No worries. The, the fun times, the life of technology. So we come and go, <laughs> and we just uh, manage to as a team. Uh, discuss it all together. David, is there anything you wanted to add before? No, I think Wayne really kind of covered it there. It's it's really just the ability to add extended visibility beyond just the endpoint. Um, you know, traditional legacy antivirus, which is what a lot of, you know, small to medium sized businesses will run today is maybe a legacy antivirus software that just really isn't up to speed and really up to the level of sophistication that the hackers are up to nowadays. And so it's a it's a need to really take ownership of that risk that the, the business owner ultimately owns. They're the they're the data owner. The data owner owns the liability for their data. And and so having help from an ideological, you know, to come in and do a security risk assessment is really to Wayne's point going to shine a light on where are the vulnerabilities where can we make recommendations so that they can show that that SMB owner I'm not you know don't take my word for it here's what the report shows and then to Matt's point insurance companies a lot of times are are mandating certain things and and it's another way to align the recommendations along with what their insurance policy probably says and and the owner may not even realize that Thank you for that addition, Matt. Wayne, before we move on to uh, one other question that I have under this uh, pillar for today's conversation, is there anything you wish to add? No. Not. I think it's well covered. Yeah. Perfect. Great. The next point, I think, Wayne, you had briefly touched upon. You mentioned government as well. And um, we, uh, as part of the Cyber Right Now Group, but also Chamber, yes, we do engage with the federal government here in Canada on various levels. And I just want to hear from your view and anybody here on the panel also uh, from, from the US, of course, how are the different levels of government in the United States and also Canada, from your point of view, are engaging on cyber, looking at cyber, investing in cybersecurity? So who would like to start off? Well, from the Canadian side, and you know, we've been on those meetings. There's obviously engagement from uh, various levels that we've seen, including CSIS, which is the Canadian uh, spy agency. If uh, you don't know what that is for the U.S. folks, um, all the way to that level, coming all through on the different attack vectors, and you know, building tools actually that they can utilize in government systems, but even making it available for businesses as well. They're kind of on the cusp of that, you know, potentially being a thing. Um, we're pushing, at least from a small business perspective, uh, very much on an education front. You know, in the meantime, while this stuff is evolving and, and get, coming to fruition, education should be pushed across the board and, you know, encouraged. You know, obviously there's IT companies out there who know, you know, that this stuff needs to happen. So they're actioning that, but not everyone are. And some businesses don't even have good IT companies at all. So they don't know what they don't know. So trying to push that education front out there. Uh, which is being discussed, uh, you know, definitely on how the, could that be deployed from a government level. And then as well, as was mentioned, insurance is a great avenue, and this has definitely been suggested and they're considering is from an insurance point of view, how can they give me, we can be engaged there to maybe put some mandates down where you have to have this certain level of, you know, cybersecurity tools in order to get the insurance or whatever the case may be. So it's kind of tricky the way the insurance works in Canada, but uh, they're definitely talking about that and considering that as an avenue because David, as you said, insurance companies are, you know, I remember, you know, we do the cybersecurity application for a lot of our clients are filling out the forms. It's gone from half a page to now like six pages of questions because uh, they're definitely getting wise to it and are definitely asking better questions now these days. I'm sure they're paid out a lot of stuff they didn't want to pay out. So, 
I guess we all live and learn, right? Also the insurance companies. So <laughs> Matt and David, from a US perspective, uh, could you, would you like to share your view here on government initiatives and uh, uh, their involvement and view of cybersecurity? Well, I think just, you know, like Wayne was saying, it's, it's just becoming more and more um, prevalent and more serious to the point where there was signed legislation here in the U.S. back, I think it was March of this year, and there was a, a, a Cyber Incident Reporting Act that was signed by President Biden, which was really, uh, they identified 16 critical industries or infrastructure sectors uh, in which they required them to report cyber incidents within 72 hours if they're experiencing a cyber attack um, and within 24 hours of making a ransomware payment. So, you know, industries that are, uh, uh, you know, chemical industries, communications, defense, you know, healthcare, just, you know, to name a few, but there's about 16 critical, uh, in, you know, sectors that they're requiring them to report within 72 hours of experiencing an attack or 24 hours of making a ransomware payment. So they're they're taking it very seriously now because in a lot of cases, companies don't want to report, you know, due to reputation, brand, things like that, that can suffer. So, and to get ahead of this, I think it's becoming mandated. And so. in Canada, they're just starting that actually, the, the mandatory reporting part. So, yeah. yeah. So that's what we're seeing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matt, is there anything you wish to add or do you want me to uh, move on to the uh, what organizations could or should be doing? You know, honestly, just to add to it, um, you know, everything that, you know, was already pretty much was already said was in place. Yeah, we're seeing it coming down from, you know, the White House. Um, you know, we, there are specific uh, websites now on our uh, on our U.S. Uh, government websites now for companies to uh, understand and learn the different things, you know, that they need to do to protect themselves. Um, so uh, there's definitely a lot more involvement that there that there was. Um, and uh, it, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely helping change things for the better um, as well. That's, that's what I'll add to it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, you're ahead of the game. So we, we will catch up eventually. <laughs> um, and uh, in terms of what we, we, we touched upon this already, uh, but maybe in more detail for those who uh, are here today, what could or should organizations really be doing to prevent cyber incidents and attacks? And I really say today, and I, again, looking into the future, there was a lot of mentioning as well, Wayne, you talked about AI as well. There is AI driven cybersecurity and so forth. So maybe any specifics and implementable solutions again. Um, Matt, for example, uh, how much time and money, I mean, that might be a bit of a loaded question, but should really an organization spend on their cybersecurity efforts? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a loaded question, but honestly, it's, it's really as much as they need to. Um, you know, it's really hard to put a number on it, uh, but I think what every organization really needs to understand is, is they need to know that um, that it is a threat and it's, it's, it's real. Um, there is uh, the idea that we're just going to pretend and it's just going to go away is not a really good practice. And I would argue that it's actually almost dangerous uh, in order to do that. Um, you know, consulting with a good professional, you know, uh, a good IT professional or a trusted company, um, you know, uh, or IT consultant um, that understands uh, this, uh, this world uh, understands uh, and understands how to uh, proactively um, identify these things and to uh, has a basically a cybersecurity strategy uh, in a you know in a, in a, in a proven approach uh, to protect a company and also not only to protect but also to quickly recover uh, from an incident um, is going to be your your best bet um, and if you if you don't have a, a strategic partner in that area if you don't have anybody in there uh, definitely start start asking uh, because it's it's unfortunately it's becoming more problematic today and um, you know the, the, the key here is to uh, just have a, a a good framework in place to uh, not only identify the equipment and the you know the computers and the servers and everything that you have to run your business but uh, look at, you know, in response, looking at detection, looking at how to proactively respond to those 
uh, types of incidences or you know potential threats that are out there and ultimately how to recover. Um, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing practice. Um, so having the right people in place and the right partnerships in place is going to be very important. Um, so that's uh, I think that's the key to, to the approach. And you know, as far as how much we spend it, it it's really gonna it's really gonna value and I, I, it's really gonna vary. And you know, honestly, risk is different for for every company. You know, so how much is, is too much and how little is too little. Um, you know, understanding you know to every business. You know what? What are the you know things that are going to be you know what what's really critical? How much you know data can you lose, and how much you know uh, downtime can you take as a company is going to be uh, a really important thing to understand. So there you go. Yeah, thank you very much. I I will let the other panelists comment as well, and I agree amounts might be difficult, but they I was uh, just thinking about it further. There are certain percentages when you plan your strategic plan or business plan that you will allocate, which sometimes gets forgotten. Um, other uh, considerations have often priority, and I think that goes back to the awareness and education of the importance of investment in cybersecurity, time, finances, resources, talent, and so forth, and equipment. Uh, Wayne, David, is there anything you wish to add on board question and comment? I'll let Wayne go first, if you like, if you have something. A uh, little bit, not, not huge. I mean, Matt covered a, a great amount of stuff there. But, um, you know, Constantly engaging with that IT company that you're with is super important to understand what those costs are and kind of always have it in your mind that there might be some more investment next year that needs to be done. So you need to kind of consider at least from a budget perspective. And then once you sit down and analyze with that IT company about whether that you know, action you need to do is actually going to be something you need to worry about, or is there another thing they could do you know, as opposed to spending more money on that? Because you're right, you, you can't just keep spending money until the moon. But considering a budget increase, you know, regularly, at, at least on the cybersecurity front, uh, super important uh, to at least consider and not just think it's going to be business as usual in two years, three years uh, with regards to costs on tools, because there will be more that you need to do. Eventually, everyone catches up depending on what industry you're in. Uh, so that's really my kind of contribution on that is just considering the budget always there needs to be some sort of consideration to an increase to help continue to protect yourselves. And some of it may be insurance wise, maybe it's premiums, et cetera, because those obviously increase as the attack level increases as well in the environment. So we want to keep that in mind. So definitely an element of the business and strategic plan every year, sometimes maybe quarterly to be reviewed. David, any other comments on this? No, I think they're they're spot on. I mean, I think what when you kind of ask what can business owners do, it's it's to work with um, you know an ideological to to do the security risk assessment. The first thing they can they need to do is just identify what data do they have that they need to protect. You know, how, like Wayne, like Matt had said, um, what level of risk are they comfortable with? Because the business owner and the, the data owner owns the liability and the risk here. Uh, the, you know, the managed service provider is there to help them through that journey of cybersecurity and better cyber hygiene. You know, one of the best analogies I heard was that, you, you know, you go to the doctor at, you know, one month and they tell you, you're in great health, Dave. But, you know, that doesn't mean that if I go out and I eat a bunch of Twinkies and, you know, drink too much or do something I shouldn't be doing that I'm not going to be in terrible health a month from now. It's a constant maintenance type of a thing. And same, same with cybersecurity. Because the attacks are constantly evolving, you do need to be planning for this. And, and I think budgeting for it. And so starting out with the assessment about being able to identify what is important to the business, what do you need to be protecting? And this kind of goes back to Matt's point about, you know, and, and Wayne's point about following frameworks, you know, like NIST and, and any kind of framework that, that the country of Canada is going to adhere to in terms of good cybersecurity, but it's being able to identify what's valuable how will you go about protecting it? To your point, Ulrich, about you know using tools like MDR, SIM, and SOC uh, to protect. But what happens when that protection breaks down? It's about being able to detect where are they in the environment? Where have they been? What have they encrypted? What data have they taken? And then how can you respond? Are you set up? Is the company set up to respond 
and then ultimately recover from an attack and get back to business as usual. And too often with small to medium-sized businesses and the cost of an attack, we don't see the respond and recover piece in some cases. You know, and so again, it's starting out with the assessment and identifying where are you vulnerable and then being open to looking at how are you strategically budgeting for cybersecurity in today's day and age. Yeah, thank you, David. Very passionate sure. about this. I love it. This is great. <laughs> sure. uh, no, seriously. And while we talk about um, the recovery or possibly at times you may not be able to recover, somebody on the panel mentioned also the reputation that can be at risk, right? If you are not taking good care of your data, your customers, um, your employees and so forth, uh, reputational risk is sometimes actually uh, irreversible. Um, so that is definitely a very major consideration. Um, so we, we are familiar, I believe, with the saying, um, it's not about the if, uh, but when it happens, but there seems to be a new um, saying around that was brought to my attention. I'd like to hear your view on this. Um, you're already compromised. You just don't know it. So that's, again, a pretty scary assessment of a situation. Any comments on this, um, perhaps even examples of uh, where it may have happened or any advice? And how do we even find out that you have been compromised, but you you don't know it, but it's it's already happening. And it's, I wouldn't want to say too late. We want to give everybody here optimistic hope and that there is actually a solution to this. Best to avoid it and to prevent it, but once you're there, what are the next steps and um, what do you think about this? David, can I stay with you as you're already on the screen? Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think if if it's one of those where you're already compromised, it kind of goes back to something I may have mentioned earlier about dwell time. Um, in a lot of cases, businesses don't even realize that attackers, when they deliver a ransomware email, they've already been in the environment for, in some cases, a hundred and something days. I've, I've heard dwell times of 125 days, 180 days, you know, that type of a thing where attackers can be living in the business's environment and setting up back doors and doing, you know, all kinds of shady things to basically be figuring out what's valuable in that business's network. And they could have already encrypted the files exfiltrated the data that they need. And by the time that that business owner gets the ransomware, they've already been there and done what they needed to do. They're now telling you we've been there and done what we needed to do. Uh, David, I don't think I can hear you anymore or see you, unfortunately. Um, and uh, so, uh, that is a little bit of a deja vu, which is uh, we have practiced with us now. We we see Wayne or Matt. Uh, would you like to continue while David is trying to come back online? Wayne, I see you there with a smile, so maybe it's your turn. <laughs> I was going to say Matt could go next, but uh, <laughs> uh, so with regards to uh, the you know what you, what you can do, um, part of the thing when these new attack factors come in, there's usually already something in place that you know is, can already protect against it just maybe not widely used yet because people haven't adopted because the vector isn't there it hasn't it's not as common so again a good it company will watch for those threat vectors that come up and then there's usually some sort of procedure a tool a service of some kind that'll help get ahead of that so you know keeping in tune with those and and engaging with those is really the best best thing you can do uh, at this particular juncture. Uh, again, the zero day being really big, so trying to get be proactive on that, uh, that's super crazy. It's still really tough to get ahead of that, but a lot of the tools they have are actually very smart and we've been able to get some vectors in before they're able to do anything. But yeah, the, the laying low time, the most we've seen, I haven't seen a hundred days, that's a lot. Two weeks is the most we've seen. Um, but again, having another tool in place that it's kind of more prevalent now, more common now, would have caught that, you know, maybe on day one or two instead of day 14, so. Yeah, Matt, I, uh, thank you very much. Matt, over to you, please. Yeah, I'll, I mean, as far as people sitting on the network, uh, you know, and the, 
you know, what you said, you know, are you already compromised? You know, you just don't know it. Um, not sure if I entirely agree 100% with that statement, but what I can say is, is that if you don't have the tools to determine if you're compromised or not, how are you going to know? Um, you, you, you can't protect what you don't know. Um, and so as far as the, the time somebody set is, is, is actually on a network, um, uh, actually latest data that we've gotten um, out of a couple different reports uh, from the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, through Verizon, and also through IBM, um, that number is now up to 287 days. Um, and there is, um, and of that time, it kind of breaks down to like 200 and some days of uh, them actually in there and not being detected. And then about another 75 plus days, uh, give or take, to actually remediate that breach. Um, so they can really be in there for a long time. Uh, and to David's point, you know, it's, uh, it, it is, it's concerning because, you know, they could be sitting there for a long time and just gathering data about you or, uh, you know, anything. They could be looking at files, they can be looking at bank statements, they can be looking at any of this stuff and then really planning a strategic ransomware attack to, to cripple your business. Um, so, you know, um, and, and, the, and the unfortunate thing is, is the, the, for the most part, the, the, the majority of the time that the way that they're getting in um, and gaining access is still through through phishing. It's through those emails. It's through, um, you know, uh, those sophisticated social engineering uh, campaigns that they're they're doing. And um, people think like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough to know when a, a phishing email comes in. I've seen some of the latest ones, and I'm telling you, I, I almost fall for them myself uh, because they are that good. They're, they're well crafted, um, and you got to understand, this is not just a couple people trying to trying to get into a business or to uh, you know try to hack a, a small business. Um, it's a well organized team, um, and there's big money involved, um, and they're throwing everything they possibly can at you. Um, so it, that that's that's really the contributing cause. Um, from the FBI, they from from 2018. To 2020, they saw about a 917 uh, percentage increase in attacks in uh, phishing attacks to uh, people in the United States. And that was specific within the SMB market, which is uh, 500 employees or less. So um, not only are we seeing increases in phishing, but we're seeing a very strategic approach uh, and direct path to the small to mid-sized business because most enterprises and large companies are uh, have been ahead of the game for a little bit. Um, they've they've done what they they, they can to, to lock everything up, um, and they know that there's the attackers know that there's a big gap uh, that's out there uh, for the SMB market because historically they haven't had the ability to protect themselves in these types of in these types of methods, uh, but now they do. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, my goodness, if you think over 200 days somebody is lurking in your environment and lives with you without you knowing it, th th that's really a, a very uncomfortable thought. Um, and uh, it, it shows where we've come to. And uh, so, so in that regard, I mentioned three areas before, and it's great that we are all touching upon them at the same time. So we, they all come together. In that context, um, if a business leader or any IT controller, I mean, they would like for advice, uh, look for advice and say, I only have so much budget available. Where, where do I even start? Is it talent? Is it tools? Is it education? Is there any particular order of priority? What should I focus on first? I'm interested in getting started and taking this really seriously and upon myself and my company. So what is your advice here as um, experts on the panel if anyone comes with such a question and is seriously interested in, in, in improving and ensuring they're cyber secure? Um, Matt, you're nodding. Maybe I start with you, if that's okay. Yeah, I think uh, for the most part, um, I think uh, at least our stance is that education is going to, to really be a big proponent of that. Um, the, the, it used to be back 20 years ago, you know, you need hardware and software to protect your company. Uh, you could throw you know, a piece of software in place. You can put a, you know, a firewall in place, for example. Um, and for the most part, you're protected. Um, as the business environment has changed, as remote work has changed and people are outside of the organization now, you know, um, as far as education is concerned, you know, having a well thought out strategic um, 
cybersecurity training program is going to be is going to be key. And I don't mean a once a year or once a quarter training. I'm talking about a program from your provider or your partner uh, that is going to actually simulate these attacks for your company to where you are going to get specific data about down to the user level about who's clicking on what, what type of threat that they uh, uh, that they potentially you know they could have potentially let in, and then following we following up with those individuals uh, and giving them specific training um, and have that awareness. That that's going to be uh, very uh, it's going to be really key. Um, from there, um, I think there's different avenues you can take, uh, but really having a good understanding of your of your technology. Um, going back to that, identify. Um, you can't protect what you don't know what you don't have. So having uh, just a good visibility on uh, on uh, all of those uh, those assets that are key to your company, all those computers, those laptops, all of that stuff, um, and making sure that you have you know the right uh, you know things as simple as spam filtering, antivirus, that type of stuff in place. Um, it, to start, that's where it'd go, uh, and then from there you can you can build from there from there. So um, I'll let you guys add to what you think you'd like to add in there too. <laughs> David, you you are back. Have been for a while, which is fantastic. Do you have anything? Would you like to add something? <laughs> yeah, here. yeah. Apologies for the network issues. Uh, yes, I would. I would just kind of reiterate that I would start with the with the assessment because uh, just to Matt's point, you know, you you really don't know what you don't know until you do the assessment and can see where you're vulnerable, um, and then from there, you know, your provider can make recommendations because. At small to medium sized businesses, they need to realize that at some point they're going to need to eat the elephant and the ele you eat the elephant one bite at a time. Right. And, and and so it's going to be taking some actionable steps on, in cybersecurity. Use the assessment as that roadmap to see where those recommend those top recommendations would be and then go from there because it will be a journey. Wayne, is there, uh, thank you, David, uh, something you wish to add? No, they both stole my thunder. The assessment is a, a great place to start because not only just, you know, running a tool or whatever, even just sitting down and talking about the business and how transactions are made or how they function in the cloud on-premise, stuff like that all goes into this assessment piece that David was talking about. Great place to start because at least gives you that path on where you need to focus on first, which areas, and then work from there. And I, if I may allow myself to stay with you, Wayne, we've talked a lot about phishing, which is a, it's a really end of sophistication as well. So um, how can someone, I don't know, prevent from becoming a victim? I mean, that might go back to education as well and being aware, but as we say, they become more sophisticated and we talking about it might also sometimes are about to fall for it. We've seen that with, within uh, my own uh, organization as well. And in addition to the phishing question, I would like to as well know if somebody already clicked on that link or the attachment and shouldn't have to because they really thought it was from one of their colleagues or stakeholders, what do you do then? Because now you clicked on it and invited the, right. the trouble into the house, yeah. Yes, no, exactly. So part of what we tell people is, uh, you know, we want kind of a certain uh, very, you know, a low level of paranoia level out there just to give you that little bit of pause, just to, you know, nothing, nothing urgent, dealing with money, ask you to click a link, asking you to open attachment that, you know, you're not quite sure what it is. All these are flags. So, you know, we can go through more detail, hopefully your IT provider is actually providing you this, but certain cues you can find in emails that make it look suspicious, certain actions that you shouldn't be doing, nothing really should be that urgent that you have to rush and click on something right away. So we want that pause, five seconds pause, just to look at things a bit closer. Is it actually coming from where it's coming from? And even if it all looks really, really good, you know, even contacting that person, if they're asking you to actually do some sort of transaction or click on something just to make sure are good, steps to take to be cautious on the email now if you happen to actually click it and things you know we just kind of put people you know if you notice something a list is going to shut down your machine immediately and unplug the network cable call your it provider immediately 
uh, that at least prevents it from spreading on your machine or potentially the network. And you kind of just take yourself offline for the moment until that can be properly assessed. So, but yeah, that that pause and not people because people still fall for gift card scams. I still see that. That's like the oldest trick in the book now. And uh, you know, and it's because of some sort of version email. You know, it looks like it's coming for your boss, but it's not. And they're just ready to jump and move. And you know, just take that extra five seconds. This is legitimate. Make a call, double check, confirm. All good. So that's what we recommend uh, generally to our clients. I like your recommendation on just take a break. We actually always say also pause, slow down. And we are also busy on different devices. It's uh, making music everywhere. We get alerted. And then we just want to squeeze in that one email and click that attachment. Slow down, pause, take a break, take a breather. I mean, this is such really great advice. It seems so simple. And yet as we're also busy and always trying to be really hectic in our schedules. That's, again, another vulnerability and opportunity. Um, Matt, is there anything you wish in particular also to the phishing topic or anything that Wayne just shared with us? Would you like to add anything there? You know, as far as, you know, uh, phishing is concerned, you know, um, I, I will say that kind of many organizations, I, I, I still kind of see they're not doing enough. Uh, again, kind of what I've already said, you know, people kind of always thought you can just kind of put hardware and stuff in place and, you know, you're good. Um, but uh, you know, to Wayne's point, you know, that's one of the things we teach here too, is that it's, you know, to, to, to pause, to stop, to really look at that. Um, don't reply to an email if you think it's suspicious, uh, because that's another way that they can potentially get in, you know, call that person instead, you know, uh, pop your head over the cubicle, you know, in the office and, and say, hey, you know, is... Uh, did you really send this to me? Do you really want me to wire a hundred thousand dollars? You know, do you really want me to get gift cards? You know, that's uh, those are all very good, uh, good points. You know, and uh, unfortunately, the, the ones that we think we would never fall victim to, other people are. Um, so it, it's it takes all of us uh, to 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 better the you know, the cybersecurity hygiene for the company. Yeah, thank you, Matt. It goes back to my earlier comment. It starts with us and myself uh, as well and being accountable. And uh, before we go to the um, questions from the audience, uh, David, is there anything you wish to add to that topic that we just discussed? I was just going to say, you know, I agree with everything that we were just mentioning in terms of the fishing piece, you know, and, but just to go back quickly to what you were saying about where can they start, you know, it, I think on top of just the assessment, when, when you're meeting with, you know, your, your ideological team to review or go over the security assessment, I think one way to understand best where they, the business owner needs to start is to bring a copy of their cyber insurance policy with them to that meeting because they can take a look. If any of these uh, business owners are in a highly regulated environment, healthcare with HIPAA or finance or government, then that insurance policy might help them dictate where they need to focus their attention because they may have specific requirements within that policy that say you need to have multi-factor authentication you need to have managed detection and response you need to have sim those are your minimum standards because your healthcare or finance those those other smb owners that maybe don't have those highly regulated environments they may not have all of those standards. They may need, you know, have a different set of recommendations made just based on budget as well as minimum standards that they need to, to up, upkeep. Um, so that may be another great place to start is when you're starting with the assessment, bring a copy of the cyber insurance policy so that you can align where you need to focus and where you need to start so that you're in compliance with what your what cyber insurance companies are asking of, of you today so i really like uh, the focus today as well as uh, on cyber insurance i must say that because this is a conversation we just recently have been having within our own membership and with organizations so important so thank you so much for bringing this uh, into the conversation and all the other points of course we do have um, a few questions from the audience and let me have a look at them here to see. Uh, uh, and those people were just really fantastic uh, that they have made the effort and handed in and show really that interest to participate. Um, 
One question is, um, which we may have touched upon, what is the disturbing trend you see cyber criminals using to gain access to environments? Is there anyone on this panel who would like to take this one and get started? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one here. Thank I mean, you. One of the, one of the things that, I mean, like we've talked about, we, we've talked a lot about phishing, but that's, that's still uh, across every type of report from the latest data from the FBI, from uh, our partners at Verizon through IBM, it, it's still phishing. Um, because it's it's not it's it's the human element that is the unfortunately the problem um you know whether it's you know stolen credentials or you know links that people are clicking on um these criminals have what's disturbing is is that these criminals have far more resources today um than they have you know in the past um you know the dark web it sounds scary you know i i wish we could come up with a different name for it to be honest with you but it, it, it's a it's a it's, it's a highly organized uh, group of people, um, and there's hundreds of thousands of people that are um, going in there. And there's full marketplaces. It's a, it's a whole other economy uh, that is uh, all working with uh, digital currencies to uh, buy and sell services, um, creating custom ransomware, uh, selling uh, and buying of uh, credentials to do things like credential stuffing. Uh, to where people can gain access. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, is that it continues to grow. And the other thing that's disturbing too, that um, we've seen evidence of and from from people that we brought on in, into our, that um, the, the younger generation uh, seems to be more aware of this. And it seems like um, not only do companies gotta worry about, you know, a data breach or stolen credentials and all this other stuff, um, even as far as uh, disgruntled employees, people that have been terminated from a company and feel uh, wrongly that they were terminated, uh, know about these things and um, are actually working with uh, hackers, you know, hacking as a service to, to Wayne's point. Um, we've, we've seen uh, some growing trends in this as well, where people that are not educated about, you know, are highly educated, you know, in, uh, in, in, in cyber or, or hacking themselves, uh, but will list the services of these individuals to uh, make the make make known to them the these different vulnerabilities there and, and try to uh, overtake a company or to uh, you know deploy a ransom or, or something to that effect so um, it, it's uh, unfortunately it is is growing uh, but the good news is is that there are a lot of things that you can do to protect yourself so that that's what I would say is some of the the more kind of um, uh, disturbing trends that, that I've seen recently. Uh, what I, I like to provide a quick comment saying, thank you, Matt, for bringing actually up the internal threat. We talk a lot about external, but you brought current and also former employees. Um, that is uh, definitely uh, an area of concern. And uh, thank you for bringing this to this conversation. One sometimes seems to forget. Um, Wayne and David, is there anything you wish to add or would you like me to move on to the next question? I think you can move on. Matt did very well on that question. I move on. So you feel we, we've done well. So we need your approval for that. There you go. <laughs> the next question would be, um, we talked about cyber insurance. So how, and when I stay with you, I'd like to hear the Canadian view here as well, because uh, cyber insurance is so important. How has the attitude around cyber insurance shifted given the increase in high profile cyber incidents? Is there anything for you to share? Well, it's definitely been shifting uh, the way people approach cybersecurity, what they engage in. So we, a couple in the summer, there were a couple of renewals for some of our clients. And they required very high level, and we had to actually do some quick action deployments of certain security measures, including an MDM solution in one case, in order to meet the minimum requirements for the cybersecurity. And we had like a month to do it because they're expiring in a month. So, you know, we're definitely seeing a shift in that respect where insurance companies are asking for a lot more, demanding uh, higher requirements. And uh, yeah, we're analyzing those and telling them whether they meet them or not. So that in a way is driving people to do better on their cybersecurity or their uh, tools and their systems uh, to protect themselves. So definitely seeing that uh, starting 
for us, it was in the summer we saw that kind of so far. And as others renew, I'm sure we're going to see more of it. I would like to call it a positive trend. This yes. Is, uh, absolutely. So, uh, and ending on that positive trend and note, uh, I would like to invite everyone as we are nearing the end of the webinar to have perhaps one last statement and advice that you would give and leave the audience with. Perhaps one statement uh, where you say one takeaway you want the audience to know and take back uh, to their businesses or colleagues. Um, David, what do you have to share there? Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, for, you know, having me to the uh, the discussion, but I would, you know, just, just reiterate that the, the business owner is the, you know, the one who owns the liability in this scenario. And, you know, your provider is really there to try and help steward that data and be, you know, keep you in a, in a better, you know, lowered risk exposure type situation. Uh, but the, the best way to do that is the assessment and evaluating where you're vulnerable. Thank you very much, David. Matt, how about you? Um, as far as one takeaway, I will encourage everybody is to really engage either with your, your current IT provider, you know, your current IT person or team, and really make sure that, uh, really to start the conversation of making sure that you are doing everything that you possibly can uh, in, in order to have a good cybersecurity strategy. Um, you know, don't think that this is just something that we're here just talking about and it's something that um, is, isn't going to happen just because it hasn't happened already. Um, that's one of the biggest mistakes I think uh, anybody in this day and age can make. Um, you know, it is really, truly, I think, a matter of time for, for most uh, people. And if you aren't having your network and your, your security, you know, uh, level you know, essentially upgraded, um, you, you're going to have these open vulnerabilities and, and people are going to see that and then they're, they are going to attack you. So, um, you know, you really want to make sure that you can do everything you possibly can to reduce the, the overall risk with uh, within reason. Um, and, and in order to do that, it's really uh, talking to, you know, the, the professionals, you know, and if you feel that maybe you don't have that person right now or that team with you right now, uh, to reach out to, you know, your network, uh, reach out to other trusted uh, individuals and say, you know, who are you talking with about this? Who do, who's a good resource? Um, me, along with uh, Ideological, uh, you know, we're all part of uh, several different peer groups um, as well. And uh, there, even though we might, maybe you're viewing this and you see that uh, maybe you're part of a, maybe you're on the other side of the world or you're, you know, in a different state, or, you know, uh, or area, um, there's people that we talk with and other uh, MSPs and partners that we talk about across the United States and also Canada. Um, so the reality is, is that um, somebody who is trusted and has a good uh, uh, practice and plan in place uh, is, is available to you. Um, so definitely uh, take the time to reach out and, and start that process today versus, you know, uh, versus waiting. Thank you, Matt and Wayne. Yeah, I mean, time. David and Matt said a lot. The only thing I'll add is, you know, there used to be an old adage, we're just too small of a company. People don't want to hack us. That is not the case anymore. Uh, they don't look at it that way. So, you know, everyone needs to kind of treat it on the same level of seriousness. Uh, you know, doing that audit, absolutely. Uh, engaging those conversations with your IT providers. And uh, yeah, just, you know, Sometimes it feels like we're just trying to peddle new services or tools just to, you know, gain a buck. It's actually not the case. We spend a lot of time and effort looking at what's happening and how to respond to those or how to be proactive on these particular attacks. So we're actually recommending them for good reason. And we've seen it actually happen, whether it be through case studies or maybe sometimes along across our own set of clients that we deal with. Uh, but yeah, that's very good reason. That's why we do this information, you know, webinars and sessions exactly is is to show those and, and put them on display so everyone can be well informed so you can make an educated decision on how you want to approach your business thank you very much everybody thank you david thank you matt and wayne as well and thank you ideological for putting on this session and uh, educating us more and uh, i i feel always the journey has just begun because it's an ongoing conversation as it should be 
And it all starts with us. As we said, there's a lot of human element as well involved uh, and only technology is only often as good as the end user as uh, the same often applies to policies. So thank you once again and to the audience you uh, from what I understand can find this recording in the future online. And uh, you can gladly and please broadly share it. It was a very important conversation and I look forward to more. So everybody have a wonderful rest of the day. And thank, thank, thank you. you for mediating as well. Appreciate your help today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank Bye. Thank Take you. Care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Hey, everybody.